Welcome. My name is Tiersa Coates, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Decision Lens. I have the privilege of hosting today's Expert Spotlight, and we have a fascinating topic for you today. Our speaker is Dr. Allison Denton. She's uh, the Director of the Program Management Office here at Decision Lens. And Allison's going to share the best ways to boost stakeholder engagement in public planning. She's going to use five case examples from a variety of industries, and she's going to use those to illustrate her recommendations. So I assure you this webcast is going to be very meaty, very much worth your time. Now for a little context, let me tell you very quickly about Decision Lens and why this topic is so near and dear to us. Decision Lens is a software solution for strategic prioritization and resource optimization. Our analytics, our visualizations provide clients with the insights they need to prioritize their capital investments and then optimally allocate their resources to the projects and the programs that really give them the biggest bang for their buck. We serve a multitude of commercial and federal and state and local organizations. Um, our capital asset solution has been hugely successful in the public sector. Uh, clients rely on decision lines for strategic planning, help with budgeting decisions, capital improvement plans, and general facilities management. We have the privilege of working alongside these planning teams throughout the year, so we're very well familiar with the challenges that they face. And time and time again, we keep hearing that the struggle to incorporate feedback, either from the public or from other stakeholders, really hinders productivity, and here's why. Well, it's the complexity. Public planning is absolutely inexact and complicated. There are different decision makers, citizens, constituents, engineers, planners, legislators, and they all have to have a voice in the decisions that we make. Um, the competing priorities that they bring to the table make things complex, and what's important to one group may not even be on the radar of another group. The resource constraints um, are daunting, so teams are under intense pressure to meet all their stakeholders' needs, but you know, doing that with very limited budgets, very few people, very little equipment. And then the data sources and the opinions that are coming to the table. Everyone's bringing their own data in varying formats, varying levels of detail, et cetera. It makes it very difficult to really execute um, good public planning, which is what you see at the bottom of that screen. Those capturing priorities and optimizing resources. In order to do those things effectively, it really requires the engagement of your stakeholders. Now, to be fair, let's look at this from a stakeholder's perspective. Many times they aren't trying to be difficult. We simply aren't doing a great job of enabling them to provide the input. There's a couple of roadblocks to successful stakeholder engagement on this page. And take a look at it and see if there are any that look familiar to you. The first one, reinventing the wheel every planning cycle, that's about starting from scratch with a new framework every single time. It can be very frustrating for stakeholders. That second roadblock, despite your best intentions, there are just certain methods of gathering input that are inefficient. Stakeholders complain about open public forums being way too chaotic and various templates floating around making it difficult to really compare ideas fairly. The third roadblock about accountability, to many stakeholders, the planning process is just too murky. They have limited visibility into how their feedback really factors into the final decisions. And I think the last roadblock really loops back to number one. It's rare that organizations have a plan that's flexible enough to accommodate change. So they basically end up starting from scratch year after year. Now, if your organization has any of these roadblocks, do not be discouraged because each of these is certainly fixable. So how do we solve this? Well, today, Dr. Allison Denton joins us to show you several ways to boost stakeholder engagement in public planning. Allison, as I mentioned before, is the director of the Program Management Office here at Decision Lens. She's actually part of our professional services team, which works side-by-side -side with clients, helping them to pull out insights on which budget investments are highest priority and the best value. Allison has a very special background in public participation since she served as Director of Facilities Planning for a large K-12 organization. And she has significant experience working with DOTs, with federal agencies, city governments, and higher ed organizations. 
So Allison has lots of best practices to share with you today from a variety of industries. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Thanks, Allison. Thank you, Tiersa, for that great introduction and for the background to this topic. I am really excited to be here talking uh, with all of our listeners today about on this very important topic. And we have a lot to cover, so we're going to jump right in. And first, I'd like to just pose a question to all of our listeners. How many of you have been told in the past by stakeholders that the decisions that you were making occurred in a black box? It's a really commonly used metaphor in our industries, and when a stakeholder uses that term, it really means that they have a lack of trust in the mechanics of the decision process. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we aren't always clear about how we take the variety of inputs that are available to us and integrate them in a very structured and meaningful way to arrive at a decision, and then communicate that decision effectively back to our stakeholders. So for many of us, um, myself definitely included in that list, we've probably fallen into the trap of trying to address the lack of stakeholder trust and engagement by spending more and more time and resources on the input side of this equation here, and having more meetings, trying to listen to more people, gathering more suggestions, more complaints, more data, just spending more and more time on that input side. But until we can really clearly communicate about the inner workings of the decision process itself, we can't build the credibility and satisfaction in the process that really is essential to boosting stakeholder engagement. So today we'll be focusing on uh, five points in the process where we have the opportunity to boost engagement by addressing stakeholder concerns head on. We want to put ourselves in the stakeholder's shoes. What questions and concerns do they have about the process and how they can contribute and about how the outcomes reflect their priorities? So my plan today is to talk briefly about each of these opportunities, and then I'll show you an example of the concept in the decision lens solution. So the first opportunity is probably the most important. Your stakeholders want to know what factors are influencing the decision process. They don't want generalities. They want specifics. They'd like to see a list of criteria, and even better, they want to rank order to that list. Stakeholders really do want to crack open the lid to that black box and look inside. That's what's going to give them confidence in the process and increase your, your buy-in. Now, there are challenges for those of us who are decision makers or facilitators in that decision process and how we answer that question. Because we hear a lot of different perspectives and opinions. Everyone we talk to has got a goal or an agenda or a perspective they want to share with us. And the problem is that for, for, at many times, those goals are in conflict with each other, and not everything can be equally important in the context of a specific decision. So we suggest for meeting this challenge that early in the process, you try to identify and weight your priorities in a robust, transparent, and data, database process. You gather the stakeholder input and use it to quantify the relative importance of your goals. So I'm going to take a second to jump into decision lens so we can look at a specific example of how we might do that. And what I'm doing is opening up um, an example model for facilities planning in a K-12 school system, so something close to my heart. Uh, a school system that we worked with recently had, uh, make this a little bit bigger so we can all see it, was in a situation where they were experiencing really rapid enrollment growth. They had grown about 20% over a five-year period, and they were very quickly running out of seats for students in their buildings. So the school board decided that they needed to develop a capital plan to build a couple of thousand seats for students through new constructions or, or additions. They were looking at dozens of um, construction options at elementary schools, at middle schools, new construction, renovation, a whole series of different options. And they knew this would happen in a public process with a very highly engaged community. And just to add a little history or context, this community had gone through several difficult processes in the, in the recent past where a lot of time and a lot of energy was spent in discussing options, but really not much had changed. There wasn't a lot of big moves that were um, made in the outcomes of those decisions. So the board knew they needed to do something different, and they needed a structured process that both included stakeholders and resulted in an impactful outcome. They didn't have any time to waste because they were really running out of seats quickly. So they brought decision, in, decision lens in to help address this problem. So a key part of this process, as we were talking about at this first opportunity, was really articulating what are the criteria that are important to us as we make this decision. 
site. And as we look at this model here, just want to point out a couple things. So again, we're looking at building capacity, and there were four key criteria that the board determined were important to use to evaluate the options. And those had to do with increasing capacity, keeping schools at a um, preferred school range, uh, making sure we were looking at the impact to the neighborhood, and optimizing the operating effectiveness of the solution. And within each of these key criteria, we actually broke it down to have a more detailed look at what the criteria were. So for increasing student capacity, it wasn't just the number of seats that were created, but how flexible those seats were. Were they, what, what impact would we have in, in implementing a project on other renovation needs that the schools had? Or how could we relieve crowding in the process? So a lot of time was spent in very public work sessions where the school board uh, went through a process of really uh, articulating and defining the importance of the criteria through these definitions. The second part of the process then was adding weight to these criteria. And through the pairwise comparison process, and I'm sure many of you have gone through this process yourself, you know, we find this to be a really highly effective way to very quickly gather input from a large number of stakeholders in a meaningful way that results in quantifying your objectives. So the uh, outcome of this process is you, uh, actually the process itself involves setting these criteria against each other in head-to-head -head comparisons and then inviting your stakeholders to basically register their judgment about the relative importance of each of these criteria. Are these things equally important to the individuals who are participating or is one criterion more important than the other? And you can see that we had a wide range of people participating in this particular decision school board members, community liaisons, as well as senior staff from the school system. So it gave us the opportunity to gather all these disparate voices together, but also to look at, uh, from an outcomes perspective, are there differences between the groups of people who are contributing? So at the outset of the pairwise process, as you know, what you'll return to us is a quantified model that shows you not only um, the order, the rank order of the criteria, but actually puts weight to them. And um, that's something that I think was really eye-opening for the uh, officials who were involved in this process, because we always tried to balance a, a large number of priorities. But prior to, this, to the decision lens pairwise process, we weren't able to put real numbers against them and to quantify the relative the value of one criterion over another. So this gave the uh, decision makers and all the stakeholders who participated, a very solid foundation of how the decision was going to move forward and increase overall understanding. We'll jump right back here into the, uh, the PowerPoint. So just a few summary comments um, on this, this first opportunity or tip. You know, my recommendation to those of you who are listening out there is that you discuss the values and the priorities before you start evaluating the options. It will really help you to focus the conversation on the holistic decision. Once you start talking about local projects, a certain school or a certain road project, that's when emotion gets engaged. And it's much harder to keep that holistic framework front and center. Now, some additional benefits of quantifying your priorities are that your stakeholders are going to understand all the perspectives that contribute to the decision, even if they're not in agreement. You'll also be able to eliminate undue influence of what we would call the vocal minority. And how many of us in these processes have seen a disproportionate influence of one or two vocal advocates uh, on the whole decision-making process? We're also um, you know, encouraging you to promote transparency, and, and this will allow you to provide justification for your decision making. So all these benefits together will increase your credibility with stakeholders, ensure that they want to participate actively in the decision. So once your stakeholders understand the factors that influence the decision, their immediate next question, of course, is, well, how can I contribute? How is my voice going to be heard? And the logistics of aggregating input from a variety of stakeholders can be a challenge. There are always going to be obstacles to engaging stakeholders. There's going to be conflicts in meeting times or locations. You know, do you meet on a Saturday morning or a Tuesday afternoon, right? And there's going to be language barriers. There's, there's lots of ways that, that um, are obstacles that can come up for people. So what we want to try to, to do is always provide a structured opportunity for stakeholders to participate at a time that works for them and allow them to participate at their own pace, okay? 
sometimes we ask stakeholders to come to a meeting to absorb some information right away and then turn around and make a, a decision or you know, cast their vote in a certain direction. And if we give them a little more time to reflect on the information, it's going to provide a much more thoughtful response, and they'll appreciate that. So let me show you how we've tackled uh, this particular challenge using decision lens. Jump back into my decision lens lobby here. Let me close this model. And I'm going to open up something um, be called AY AYC voting in a, in a minute here. Uh, earlier this year, we supported a large transit organization in developing a five-year capital plan. And we had millions and millions of dollars in anticipated capital expenditures that needed to be spent across several different business units. And we had over 700 projects to rate. And we needed input from about 200 participants, engineers, administrators, planners, people from finance, et cetera. We were working under a very aggressive timeline. We only had about six weeks to complete the prioritization. So after we developed the model and weighted the priorities with a core team of stakeholders, we asked these 200 subject matter experts to contribute to the process using our at your convenience voting tool. So AYC allows users to submit their evaluations and add comments and color to their votes through an online resource. And you're seeing what that looks like here. They can work at their own pace, taking their time to read through the descriptions of the criteria and make their judgments and add any comments they need to on their ratings as they work through the process in a streamlined and easy to use interface. Just to show you how that works, you can very quickly and easily teach people how to use this resource, give them a login, and they're ready to go and start putting in data at, on their own timeline. So finding these kinds of solutions that help us to streamline and collect stakeholder input will help us build trust with stakeholders. They see directly how they are contributing to the decision and appreciate that we're being efficient in what we ask of them. Right? We can, uh, within Decision Lens, help manage the collection process by setting ratings assignments so that we're really targeting specific expertise from a small group of voters in evaluating our options. And we can monitor the voting process through the participant dashboard and even email people directly through Decision Lens if we need to give them a nudge. The third opportunity we have to boost stakeholder engagement is to be prepared to accommodate change. And we can't highlight this enough. Many of the decision processes we run in the public sphere have a very extensive timeline, months if not years to complete a decision. And one thing we can be sure of during these processes is that something or somebody is going to change, right? So sometimes we have new stakeholders who are coming into the process. And for them, the question is, how can I jump in in the middle of the process and become part of it um, and get engaged right away? For other stakeholders, particularly those who have been from start to finish, their question might be more along the lines of, what if new information or new events evolve to change my priorities, then what happens? How do I, how do I uh, accommodate for those changes? Now, we've all seen how interest in a decision grows as we get closer to the end of the process, and we want to make sure we can accommodate changes in both personnel and changes in circumstances in a dynamic fashion. So our su suggested solution to this challenge is to be ready to balance structure with flexibility. We have to be able to adapt or people lose faith in the process. But in order to manage that change, we want to be sure to record those inflections in the process and be able to show how the outcomes changes with new information. I'm going to jump back into a decision lens to show you a third model. And what I'm opening up here is a state CIO example where we were working with a state organization who was uh, prioritizing IT projects. And they had um, you know, gone through the entire process. They had created their models. They had gotten input from the core stakeholders on the team. And they had you know, come up with their prioritized list of projects. But um, well, as we were clo you know, closing in on the finish line, we had a change in personnel. In fact, somebody at the very top levels of the organization was um, replaced. And a new person was brought in. And this person came into a pro the process with a very different perspective based on things that were happening throughout the state. Um, in this particular situation, there have been a lot of stories that have been circulating about uh, the state using funds inefficiently. And if you look at our model here, we have four main criteria by which these projects are ranked. The 
see there's the degree of strategic alignment, um, improving technical architecture, potential for efficiencies, and the potential to improve the end user experience. You can see the weight of those criteria as, la as laid out here. Well, for this particular CIO who's coming into the organization, she was concerned that the efficiency criteria was, was only rated at 20%. And with the, um, what was going on around her and the circumstances, we wanted to take a look at how changing this weight might affect the overall outcome of the, of the project list. So, you know, many of you know that in Decision Lens, it's a very easy process in the sensitivity analysis screen. You can see I've, I've just done it here. We can quickly restack the list of projects based on changes in weight and see the impact to the priority order in the change column here. So what was very interesting to the, the top level of, of the team here was that the very uh, highest ranked projects actually stayed exactly the same. And we saw only a couple big jumps in projects on this list. So we see the EFAC service jumps up about 11 places. The third party management services jumps up about 10, 10 spaces. So that gave them um, you know, some confidence in the project list and say, we, well, we're really only going to have to make a couple of adjustments here to fund these priorities and still be able to you know, capture this new view um, of the world and the circumstances. And you know, in order to um, help record this, we can certainly save this as a new custom priority set. I'm just going to mark this here as new CIO priorities. And you know, in order to help you keep your record straight, I would recommend that you fill out this description box with information about you know, the date that things change or, or add a little context and color to why you're making these changes. And that can be saved and then be recorded as part of the decision process. What changed and why? And that then becomes part of your overall history. So this ability to accommodate change is essential to developing stakeholder credibility for both new personnel and for those who've been around for a while. We know things change, but we don't want to recreate the wheel every time there is a change in the environment. Otherwise, people lose faith in the validity of the process. So be open to the dynamic nature of decision making, and you'll be able to seamlessly integrate in new personnel as needed and monitor the impacts of those participants' votes or changing priorities on the outcomes. It will also give you the ability to eliminate what we call what-if challenges, right? So somebody comes in late to the process, they haven't been part of the whole discussion, and they want you to be able to very quickly and dynamically uh, be able to compare their priorities to what the rest of the group has come up with. And so uh, having these tools available to you, you'll be able to actually manage more effectively the inevitable change that is part of the decision-making process. Okay, so let's assume that we've moved through our prioritization process successfully, and it's really now time to start look at allocating funds. What are your stakeholders going to be thinking? Of course, they're saying, show me the money. My project is first on the list. Let's go ahead and fund it. Let's get it underway and get started. Or on the other side, if it's not high on the list, then of course there's you know starts to be a lot of churn you know in your stakeholders. What does that mean? Do I do I not get anything? Am I you know out of luck here? So there are lots of challenges in this part of the decision process because this is where we have to step back and ask ourselves, are the best ranked projects really the best investments of my dollars? What is my top priority? Take 80% of my overall budget, am I still going to fund it? Or what if 90% of the projects in one county get funding and only 20% of the projects in another county get funding? Does that really meet my goals for the decision? We want to address these challenges by optimizing funding for the best value projects. That means taking a step back, evaluating not only the benefit of the project, but the cost of that project before we go ahead and fund it. And also, we want to look at how we're spending by different segments, which might be geographic regions, it might be business units, whatever, whatever other category might be of interest to you. Decision Lens has a lot of great analytical and visualization tools to help you through this final part of the process and to be able to explain to your stakeholders the rationale behind your allocation strategy. Let me jump back into Decision Lens for a moment. And I'm going to open up uh, one more model for us. And this is a, a sample model of um, 
one of our Department of Transportation clients. Uh, we work with them to allocate funding for road and bridge projects, and we've done it for, for many years. And um, what I'm showing you here is one of my favorite tools for allocation uh, part of the process, which is the VROI chart, or the Value Return on Investment chart. And what we look at with VROI is a kind of a different perspective on our project list. Because here we're looking both at how well the project scored against the criteria and at the cost of the project. So when you're looking at the, the, the bar chart here, and I know many of you have used this in the past, the green bar represents the value, the red bar represents cost. And what Decision Lens is going to uh, allow you to look at is should we be funding projects um, not just in priority order, but looking at uh, an order based on benefit and cost ratios. So this is really a great tool for examining the impact of funding choices and being able to explain them to your stakeholders. You could run a whole series of funding scenarios and look at the overall portfolio value you can achieve in each scenario. Additionally, you can look at different categories of funding like we talked about. Um, I'm just opening up our alternative category here and you see that all the projects are also listed um, as part of a district, so geographic dif districts throughout the state. And if I start to dig down a little bit deeper here, what I notice is that District 1, for example, is getting funding, and that's represented by these orange circles, for five out of their six projects on this list. And if I move over to District 2, I see they, don't, they only get funded for two out of six projects. So knowing that kind of information ahead of time um, is going to allow you to have a much more productive conversation with your stakeholders than if you were going in blind on this kind of information. So again, lots of analytics tools that are available to you, um, and I'm not going to go into them specifically, but you know, we have Decision Lens University online and lots of other resources for you uh, to learn more about the things that we offer. Okay, so just to sum up this uh, opportunity, the allocation phase is really a great chance to collaborate with your stakeholders about the holistic impact of your funding choices. It's going to help you increase uh, transparency for the stakeholders and how your dollars are allocated. It's going to help you increase awareness of the cost and benefit for projects and help you track expenditures by segment. So it's certainly something that we, we encourage you to take a look at. So the, the last scenario that I'm going to talk about today, and then we'll open it up for, for questions and comments, is really thinking to, toward the future. So what happens after that initial decision phase ends, right? Many stakeholders have invested a significant amount of time and effort to educate themselves about the process, to participate and contribute to the process. And you want to make sure that you're leveraging that expertise and interest and build on the momentum you've created as you move into future processes. Stakeholders understand that we live in a, a continuous cycle of decision making and they want to be involved in future decisions. So our challenge is to how, to how to develop a regular process for gathering input from your stakeholder experts and again, building on that decision maturity as it evolves and customizing and streamlining the input process for those decisions that continue or repeat over time. So um, we're very excited to show you today just a very quick sneak peek at a new feature that's going to be rolled out in Decision Lens in the near future. And you're seeing just a mock-up of, of, of it here. This new functionality is called Submission Module. And it will provide a customizable, streamlined input system for users that will allow them to engage more directly in contributing information into the decision process. You're going to hear a lot about it in the future, but I just wanted to let you know that we're very excited and we think particularly from the vantage, pu vantage point of boosting stakeholder engagement, this is really going to be a game changer. We anticipate with the rollout of submission module that stakeholders will be able to engage in even more, um, uh, more ways, more frequently, and with more depth. It will help develop a standard framework for capturing data, and it will provide consistency in the type of data and the level of, data, level of detail that we're capturing from our stakeholders. It will also create a system of records so that you have better history about the kinds of the pieces of data that are coming in and becoming part of the decision making process. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kirsten now and Perfect. thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Allison. I can really see from the WebEx chats that a lot of the examples you walked through really resonated with folks on the phone. Um, very exciting. Let's start with a couple of questions that have come in. And you're always welcome to submit some more. Um, the first one that I see here, 
how many stakeholders do you need to get optimal feedback? Okay, that's a great question. Um, the answer always depends, of course, on the situation that we're dealing with. But what we find is that if you really start with a smaller group for a priority setting, you will um, you'll be able to achieve better results, right? You can't usually get 100 people around the table to set priorities. Usually a smaller group of a dozen to 15 people, uh, you know, core stakeholders is great for setting the weight of those priorities. But then as you move into the ratings part of the process, we're, we're really unlimited in the amount of stakeholders that we can engage in that process. In the transit example that I was talking to you about, I think we had 200, 250 different participants over a short time frame. So again, it's really how many stakeholders and what expertise do you need uh, you know, to tap into to really validate your decision. Excellent. All right, great. Another question that came in, uh, from a facilitation perspective, how do you handle bullies? I'm assuming they mean when you have those um, facilitated discussions in person and you have that kind of loud voice in the room. Do you have any advice for that? For that yeah, that's a great question. And I have to say that, like, my experience in, in facilitating public meetings, working in community engagement for, you know, 10 years, um, what I found and hopefully what I'm trying to convey through this presentation is that if you can get um, everybody engaged in the process and address their concerns head on, you're much more likely to, you know, get them to buy into the process and help you move forward in a productive manner, right? If you try to resist or you try to, you know, eliminate their voices, they're only going to get louder. So it's how do you bring those voices in, but do it in a way that, that you can manage and that you can still keep the process rolling forward. And your answer actually reminded me of um, a video that Dan Soddy, one of the Decision Lens founders, did. I think it's called the 800-pound gorilla or something like that. But if you guys look on uh, the Decision Lens blog, which is blog.decisionlens.com, you should find a video where he walks through kind of an example of just what you're talking about, how to kind of mitigate that, uh, that anger <laughs> that can sometimes be present in these public discussions, et cetera, and how to kind of move forward with this productive discussion. So, yeah. All right. I've got another question. Um, how do you keep the momentum up after the plan is created? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's a challenge that we hear a lot from our clients. I think the answer is you really want to keep a regular cadence up to, you know, um, the momentum that you've created, right? So you, you've had this big process. You've engaged a lot of people. Uh, it's really important to think ahead to uh, is this process going to be repeated in the future? Is it going to evolve or change in the future? And then how do you keep those people engaged, right? And I think the submission module is going to help with that because it's going to allow people to, to be uh, actively contributing to decisions even in off-peak times. Um, but you might also consider having a small group as some kind of governance board that helps, um, you know, bring the community back to the decision on a regular basis, check in, make sure that, you know, you're still executing the decisions align in alignment with what the outcome was of the process you went through, and just kind of keep everybody honest in, in, in moving through the decision and, and scheduling regular check-ins. Okay, I have a, a bit of a, I'm just curious myself, a follow-up question for that. Have you ever seen um, any of your clients kind of make changes, like do some course correcting. They've done a the plan, they had a plan, they started marching forward with it. And if they do go back and revisit it, what kinds of changes have you seen people make? Well, you know, I talked a little bit about that example with the state CIO's office where mm -hmm. we had new people coming on or kind of, you know, changes in the environment. And that's just part of, you know, life. And I think it's actually more useful to anticipate those changes than to assume they're not going to happen. Because things change and our stakeholders are going to feel uh, better about the process if they know we're ready to, to adapt those changes into the process. So it's not uncommon at all for people to spend the first year developing a, a process or a decision model, getting a lot of inputs in, and then over the course of the next one or two years to just add tweaks to that model and refine it because you learn a lot going through the process about what's important to you. And sometimes you have to have that first set of outcomes, right, that first prioritized list before you can really look at it and say, well, we didn't quite get it perfect, right? So what, what are we missing? And help, um, you know, articulate what's missing from that model that you can then go back and correct in years two or years three. Excellent. Well, thank you, Allison, for putting together such thoughtful and, and interesting use cases of, you know, great ways you've seen clients 
um, an organization boosts stakeholder engagement in this public planning process. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's absolutely essential to um, to everyone, essentially. So uh, we're going to kind of start wrapping up. We hope you found this webcast a valuable use of your time. We love to showcase thought leadership on all matters of portfolio uh, prioritization and resource optimization. I wanted to leave you with a few other resources that you can check out. The first is um, a website called capitalassets.decisionlens.com, kind of our hub for videos, research, other resources on capital planning, facilities management, et cetera. I suggest you go take a look at some of the things we have there. Um, Allison also mentioned Decision Lens University. They have really um, developed an amazing catalog of on-demand tutorials on everything about portfolio optimization. So visit them at dlu.decisionlens.com so you can um, even get a little sharper on your capital planning. And then finally, we have a thought leadership group on LinkedIn called Leaders in Capital Planning. Uh, we welcome you to uh, join us there. We have a lot of exclusive um, access to resources that uh, we make only available to members of this group. So uh, we hope to see you there and um, go ahead and submit your request to join that group and we'll approve it. Um, with that, I think we're going to close out and give you a few more minutes back of your afternoon. Thank you all for your engagement and your participation, and we look forward to um, speaking to you again soon. Have a good afternoon.